Welcome to the Commonwealth Club tonight. Uh, my name is Ken Broad, and I'm beyond thrilled to be uh, hosting and um, introducing tonight's speakers, especially since we're discussing the importance of free speech and viewpoint diversity here at the Commonwealth Club, which is itself a temple to these ideals. In particular, I wanted to highlight this evening's co-sponsors, including FIRE, the Foundation for Individual Rights and Expression, which Greg is uh, the head of, uh, Stanford GSB's Classical Liberalism Initiative, which John Cochran is very involved in um, and is absolutely fabulous. And then lastly, USC Center for the Political Future. All of these organizations are rooted in open debate and dialogue. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our guest speakers, Greg Lukianoff and Ricky Schlott. They are the authors of Canceling of the American Mind, Cancel Culture, How Cancel Culture Undermines Trust and Threatens Us All. But there is a solution. Um, Greg is one of the country's most passionate defenders of free expression and is the president of FIRE, uh, as I mentioned, the Foundation for Individual Rights and Expression. Previously, Greg worked for the ACLU of Northern California, Organization for Aid to Refugees, and the Environmenters Project. Ricky is a research fellow at FIRE? Uh, used to be. W was, okay. And is the host of uh, The Last Debate podcast. She's a columnist for the New York Post and contributes to other media outlets about free speech, campus culture, civil liberties, and youth issues from a uh, Generation Z perspective. Their new book, Canceling the American Mind, is a deep dive into the dangers uh, of cancel culture, the impact it has on our democracy and our essential principles of individuality, resilience, and open-mindedness. Lastly, I am so grateful to John Cochran uh, for moderating tonight's program. John is an economist by training and the Rosemary and Jack Anderson Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution. He authors the Grumpy Economist blog <laughs> uh, and is also an integral voice for the Goodfellows podcast, along with uh, Neil Ferguson and H.R. McMaster. Please join me in welcoming Greg, Ricky, and John. Well, let's dive in. Um, congratulations, both of you. This is a wonderful book. Thank you. Uh, I really enjoyed reading it, not just because I had a really long plane flight. <laughs> um, but uh, we usually pretend at these events that everybody's read it. So uh, yeah. we'll pretend that everybody hasn't already read it. Right. And to get an idea of it, it's full of great stories. And, and uh, let's uh, perhaps you can help everyone get a sense of the book by telling us one or two of your most informative cancellation tales. Uh, you know, there are so many stories to choose from, but one that really kind of got under my skin was a professor at St. John's um, who in 2020 gave this really fascinating presentation. We, we have the whole PowerPoint. Um, you, you can see it yourself uh, on the FIRE website. And it was about how um, in the 1530s, I think, uh, China went on the silver standard, essentially. Like they, they, they decided that all trade would be done in silver. And then the following century, of course, you know, um, uh, when Spain and Portugal ended up in South America, very quickly, kind of surprisingly quickly, you had the first trans-Pacific silver trade. Like it was it, it, globalism kind of like could, could arguably have started that point. And it's a presentation. I'm a, we're both history people. We get, we get excited about this mm -hmm. stuff. And it, uh, but at the same time, I learned a lot from this presentation. And basically one of the things was, was the Columbian exchange, was the changes wrought by the discovery of the new world worth it? Um, very interesting topic. In 2020 though, there were an unprecedented in FIRE's experience attempt to get professors fired for the smallest you know, per perceived wrong. And in this case, the students uh, decided, or one or two students decided, well, by s asking us to defend the Columbian Exchange, slavery was involved in what happened in the New World, so therefore you're asking us to defend slavery. And I think there was like a dozen people in the class and like a thousand people signed the petition. So that meant like people who hadn't been in the class, had nothing to do with it, decided that this professor had to go. And they did actually you know, force this professor out. And, and we used that to open up one of our chapters just to make the point like, that was a fascinating, like, a fascinating nuanced topic. And they got canceled because it got misrepresented a, as to what it was actually about. And I really wanna stress, in 2020 and 2021, we saw so many of these cases, we couldn't actually write press releases fast enough. Um, it was the worst, and I've been doing this 22 years and I've never seen a period like that. Um, and a lot of what the book is about is one, you know, trying to show that cancel culture is real and it's happening on a historic scale. Very quickly, our definition of cancel culture is the uptick around 2014 and accelerating 2017 of campaigns to get people 
fired, deplatformed, or otherwise punished for speech that would be protected on the First Amendment. Really, we mean as like an analogy to public employee law, but we put that in the appendix so as not to get the definition too much <laughs> in, in, in the weeds. Uh, we try to explain the cancel culture to, to get people to think about it as it's a dysfunctional way of arguing and a way to win arguments without winning arguments. And then we spend about a third of it tr trying to offer solutions. Um, and I'll give two answers to this question. One, that's a case study in our book, um, which is that of Mike Adams, which Greg knows more intimately than I do. But um, he was a professor at UNC Wilmington who uh, one controversial tweet about COVID ended up escalating to a, ca a cancellation campaign where people were showing up at his home and he was calling the police and ultimately he took his own life as a result. So I think that's the most staggering, absolutely the most staggering case study in our book. Um, and the second answer to that, I would say, is something that's come to my attention more and more since I've been a, a public voice on this topic, is the amount of parents that have come to me to say that their middle schoolers or their high schoolers have been canceled in a, a period of their life where they shouldn't really be concerned with politics. And if they are, they should be able to explore without fe fearing retribution. So that's some, something that's been really alarming to me. I, and, and I notice in, in what you say, one of the... Uh, uh, distinctive characteristics is people cancel on even though they don't read the item in question they don't know what's happened they almost That's never part actually of the me it. mechanism <laughs> yes. um, so um, I noticed a progression in your work you, you started with the coddling of the American mind and now the canceling uh, and I think we're moving on to the censoring which may be your next book <laughs> But many people... It's got to be the gerunding of some kind. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's my, <laughs> that's my suggestion for your next book. But people think of canceling as the social phenomenon. Uh, you say something dumb on Twitter, people pile on, they demand for you to get uh, hired, uh, fired. But it has moved on to organized institutional censorship. Yeah. And your book is a lot about... Now, you talk a lot about universities, and people may say, ah, academia, whatever. But you also uh, talk about scientific societies, yeah. uh, scientific publications, uh, medicine and medical schools. You have a chapter on journalism, media, tech, publishing, psychotherapy, law schools, corporation, and, and government. So this, and one on Yale all by itself. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, so um, this move, this, I think we need to understand it's not just Twitter pylons, but a, a program of organized bureaucratic institutional censorship. So explain what's going on there, and, and I in, invite more stories uh, on, on that topic as well. Okay, it will take me about five hours to explain all that. <laughs> Um, well, you got about seven minutes by my <laughs> clock. Um, yeah, the, the institutionalization of, of this stuff is something that, because I, I, I went to Stanford for law school. I, I got to you know visit uh, yesterday, which was really nice. And I, I, I was like the happiest law student you ever met. Um, I worked at the ACLU back in 1999. And uh, we talk about it in the book as the slow motion train wreck, that essentially it was really clear that particularly elite institutions were starting to uh, become much more free speech skeptical, which is honestly a predictable thing when your group is in power. Um, essentially, if people you agree with are going to be the censors, you suddenly start saying, hey, maybe censorship's pretty good. Whereas if you're the, 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 the little guy, then you tend to argue free speech. But I don't want to just say that, that it's a... Um, uh, that it's a natural force. That there's, there was a very strong intentionality behind this as well. We call this the anti-free speech movement. There were people like Herbert Marcuse in 1965, who was very popular and respected, and guru of the new left, arguing for repressive tolerance. Um, I, I, I'm so, I just have a very hard time taking him seriously, and I, I'm always blown away that people love this guy, because his argument was, well, we're good people, and good people should have free speech, but bad people, bad people should not have free speech. And, he, and really, he, he, he very specifically said so-called right, uh, the so-called conservatives, the regressive right, um, to have a truly free society, we have to censor the two-thirds of the rest of society that doesn't agree with us. Um, it's a very primitive ancient idea, but it was treated like it was somehow groundbreaking. It's just another totalitarian idea. Um, and there were people, he had followers, he had people like um, in, the, in the critical race uh, school, what people need to understand is even though it's become sort of a boogeyman, it was a real thing. And the very first thing that, that uh, the scholars like Richard Delgado, Mary Matsuda um, did when they got together was suggest uh, hate speech codes um, that, uh, that were passed in the 80s and et cetera. And a lot of these things, even though they kept on getting defeated in court, um, just by the time I started in 2001, they were already part of the system in higher ed. 79% of schools had laughably unconstitutional speech codes, way more than had them in the 90s. And I feel like I've been trying to explain this as 
carefully and thoughtfully as I can for 22 years now as the problem in, in, you know, in, in sort of a punctuated equilibrium keeps on, getting, uh, keeps on getting worse. And I thought it was absolutely remarkable that in a, in a period where more professors were losing their jobs than I've ever seen in my whole career, and viewpoint diversity was its absolute lowest uh, at, that it's been in departments. Departments you know, sometimes don't have literally no conservatives. Uh, that you end up in a situation where th that was the time that people decided that we had to add DEI statements uh, as a requirement to get a job. And, and there's nothing tricky about what a DEI statement serves as. It's a political litmus test. It's something that people would immediately understand, you know, if it was, if it was someone from the right saying, oh, well, well, we have to ask you your opinion on patriotism, you know? Like if they did that during, during McCarthyism, we would have immediately gotten that. But the idea that as bad as it had gotten in 2020, that literally administrators looked out and uh, now, now about half of the schools have them, I think it's gonna be more like 75%, and said the problem in higher ed today is too much freedom of thought, uh, too, too much heterogeneity among the, um, among the professorate. Um, and so we, we have a whole chapter called the conformity gauntlet where we talk about the different conformity pressures from bias-related incident programs, two DEI statements that happen at every level of the academic process now. And it let, you know, I, to be frank, the uh, writing, writing the book left me quite depressed um, <laughs> and, and concerned about uh, how, how much work we have to do if we want to reform higher ed. And to circle back to your question about how it's going into institutions. Yes. The way that our partnership came to be in the first place was that I read The Coddling of the American Mind when I was a freshman in college at NYU in 2018, and it really just diagnosed all the problems that I had uh, seen in my, in my generation, but I couldn't quite uh, get to the root of what was causing them. And I, I mean, Greg describes the slow motion train wreck that he watched over the course of his career, which I'm, I'm only 23, I've really only known the worst of it, but I saw it with my own eyes, which is why I think we have a very cool kind of intergenerational lens as we uh, look into this book. But one of the things that I think a lot of people said when Gen Z came to campus and started, uh, you know, starting cancel culture mobs and teardowns and, and shouting down speakers is that once they get into the real world, they'll just leave that behind and, and they'll, they'll uh, you know, buck up and, and carry on. And that has not been the case at all whatsoever. We've brought the, the institutional administrative state of, of college campuses with us to the corporate world. We're using HR much like we might a bias response hotline. And I think that um, that's, that's how it's creeping into the broader uh, institutions and society especially because the kids that are coming from these ultra elite schools have such a disproportionate effect on on our institutions of power in this country so let me um, it, it, some of your stories are about free speech some mm -hmm. of them are about academic freedom yep I want to ask that the, the kind of difficult question yeah there's an important distinction between free speech and academic freedom mm -hmm. uh, and academic freedom is not absolute if someone hires you to to do research on cosmology the university has every right to say, and, and you want to teach creationism, the mm -hmm. university has every right to say, you know, that's, that's not what we hired you to do. Right. Uh, now, you tell some stories that seem shocking on academic freedom, but I think part of the shocking is just that um, it's, it's so ridiculous. <laughs> it was so sensible what the professor tried to do and so ridiculous that they were uh, canceled for it. But on the other hand, the other side thinks that we're ridiculous too. So um, I wonder if you want to talk about the difference between academic freedom and free speech, and maybe that academic freedom isn't the only issue that we it's necessary to have academic freedom well, it's not, but not sufficient. sufficient oh no absolutely that to reform universities in the end you need people to to want you to teach uh, a range of more reasonable things. oh yeah no i mean honestly like at this point i i, I think about uh, I, I wrote i have a substack called the eternally radical idea and i'm just going to keep on throwing out potential like solutions to higher ed reform. But I even think about, you know, if we could figure out a way that you could give Steve Pinker's on our board and basically be like, instead of getting a BA in a normal place, um, Steve Pinker's gonna be your mentor. He's gonna make you read the following 200 books. <laughs> and at the end of it, there will be, you know, 10 exams. Um, I feel like there are cheaper, better ways we could do to give people richer educations than, I, the fact that academia tries to say with a straight face that sure it costs $70,000 a year, but that's only half, and they say this all the time, that's only half the cost of educating a single student for a year. And I'm like, you're telling me there's no way to do to educate a single student for less than $140,000 a year? I'm like, no, this is, this is all gone wrong. So with regards to the distinction between academic freedom and free speech, I'm a little bit cautious to make too much of a distinction because I have a 
kind of Byzantine idea of kind of like the big Boolean circle is free speech and academic freedom is essentially like other disciplines where essentially it's freedom of speech but bounded by particular rules to get to a particular end. So it's like a partially overlapping sphere. Uh, I, I can make a chart at some point or something like that or just draw it in the air. Um, the, uh, uh, but I, I worry that there's been an attempt by academics, including Stanley Fish and Michael Barabay and Jennifer Ruth, um, to uh, and, and and also um, Robert Post at, at Yale to draw a bright line distinction between free speech and academic freedom. And, and uh, Fish went so far as to say these two things are not related at all. They're not even distinctly close to related. And why are they doing that? And Baruby and Ruth, uh, their book, It's Not About Free Speech, you know, it's in the title, is one of the only books I've ever actually called genuinely contemptible that I've <laughs> read in my life. Because it is a full-throated, um, from people at work at the American U uh, Association of University Professors, it is a full-throated argument for limiting academic freedom um, dur dur during, this, uh, uh, during this crisis. And one of the things they rely on is that I think it makes people like Baruby and Ruth and Fish uncomfortable that academic freedom as a First Amendment right it is under the free speech clause of the First Amendment. But since they're very, they very much like speech limitations, they have to find a, a sort of contorted argument to pretend that these things are entirely unrelated to each other. So they can attack free speech as much as they want, but keep their academic freedom. And weirdly also argue that, um, in, in the Baruby and Ruth book, that we need to, uh, lip, we should have academic freedom, but not for white supremacy, which, <laughs> which they define, and they, they have a chapter defending CRT. So they have the expansive and what is white supremacy? Kind of anything you don't like, uh, essentially. Um, and the, the book kind of blows me away. And just to give you what, what just to defend why, why I, I use such strong language, one of the things it does is it mentions my friend Mike Adams. Um, and it talks about what a horrifying case that was for UNCW and how wrong it was for UNCW to have to pay that money to this scoundrel, this right winger. And it's going to lead people to want to go and follow in his footsteps. They put it that way to go to a uh, to go to a, a, a fancy think tank. Um, and they mentioned that the man killed himself in an end note. They hit at it, it just absolutely blew me away when it came to Nicholas and Erica Christakis. Um, they uh, said, oh, that looked, that case looked terrible. But then again, it was videotaped by Greg Lukianoff, so it can't really be trusted. I'm like, my, my videotape can't be really trusted. <laughs> and they make the argument that actually it turns out that Nicholas and Erica, two of the finest people I've ever met, and absolutely brilliant, by the way, um, were actually provocateurs who had it coming because why? They defended free speech when they were at Harvard as well in 2012. Um, anyway, sorry. It's a digression into the. I, I, I'm, all I'm saying is, I, I don't. I think that there is a plan afoot, essentially, to divorce free speech from academic freedom that is actually fairly cynical. And just to put some Please, figures Mark. on um, on how how large the threat is to free speech and academic freedom right now, one of the things that we were able to do in this book, thanks to Fire's resources and, and troves of data, is put some real figures on it. Um, and one of them that I think is just sh shocked me, even in the process of researching this book, is that there have been, over the past decade, more than a 1,000 attempts to get professors investigated, punished, or fired for their speech, over 200 of which have been successful. So, Well, actually, two-thirds have been successful in getting them punished. but. Two 200 has actually gotten them fired. Like so, like like more like 650 have actually been punished. And and for reference, the scale in during the Red Scare was roughly 100 to 150. So yeah. we're outpacing that. This is well, and at the time of the Red Scare, that the, they, they they thought the number of professors because there was a massive study done right at the end, and there was about 63 professors that they said were fired for being communist, and there were uh, about, about 30 more who were fired for 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 different reasons, and they usually you know go, go up to about 100. And right now, you know, and, and we know that the 200 that we're talking about, which is twice as many, obviously, is a wild undercount because one in six professors said that they have either been investigated or threatened with investigation for their free speech, academic freedom, or, or teaching. 9% of students said they've been investigated for, uh, for, for their speech. One third of professors say that they, they have been uh, told to um, uh, not to uh, uh, pursue controversial research. 
Um, yeah, and and, and I, yeah, it's it's bad. Yeah, the, the self censorship. You, you guys get the little tip of the iceberg. Yeah. But the self censorship, the knowing not to do controversial research, the censorship of the sciences. Yeah. Whole whole areas of science you can't even investigate anymore. That strikes me. It's not just about I tweeted something about Trump and everybody went nuts. It's about I I did honest scientific research about something and I get fired for it or Nature won't publish it and so forth. Yeah. Those that seems to be very dangerous. Yeah, there was one particularly frightening example out of Harvard, um, Carol Hooven, who's an evolutionary biologist, who uh, went as far as to say, God forbid that biological sex exists on Fox News. And actually, she she couched that with a, a very empathetic uh statement that we should respect people's pronouns and respect transgender people, but that biological reality is a thing. And she ended up being squeezed out of her job and her career. And she told us in the process of writing this book in an interview that she even had suicidal ideation for the first time in her life. So the, the most innocuous possible statements in the sciences are things that are apparently grounds to tear people down at even our most prestigious universities. Um, yep. and, and this is one of the cases, way we try to explain. Well, one of the most important things in the title of our book is how how cancel culture undermines trust. Because there is a tendency to sort of want to compartmentalize this, to say, hey, I, I work at this company, it's great, I will never be canceled, this has no bearing on my life. Uh, wrong. Because expertise you know, relies on whether or not people think the expert class can actually be objective and unbiased. Mm -hmm. And certainly there was a lot of suspicion, given low viewpoint diversity and all these problems that people are aware of having in higher education. It, wasn't, it was already the, the prestige of higher ed has been plummeting in, in, in public opinion. The thing that makes it absolutely, uh, that utterly destroys faith and expertise is let's say you're, you're, you're looking at this debate about whether or not biological sex is real or on a spectrum. Um, and you see a case like Carol Hooven's where you know, a DEI administrator starts a campaign against her, students start a campaign against her, just for saying biological sex is real. When the next person gets up and says no, like Scientific American, says no, actually biological sex is on a spectrum, what do you think the public is going, how seriously they're going to take that opinion? When they can say, they're not stupid, they're gonna look at this and they're gonna say, huh, well, you know, the last person who said anything other than that uh, got canceled, so why should I trust you? And that's if it just happens once. When you're talking about hundreds of examples of this happening, it is utterly devastating be, uh, to trust and expertise, and frankly, it should be. If there's a whole range of opinions that experts aren't allowed to have, why should you trust expertise? Yeah, the decline in trust of our institutions is something very serious, yeah. and a lot of it comes because, well, you catch them doing this stuff and you don't believe them next time. Yeah. I, I want Ricky to go first this time. Uh -huh. uh, <laughs> and uh, so since you wrote the book, many thing, interesting things have happened. We're gonna talk about two of them, but the first is, that the Twitter files came out and the savage Missouri v. Biden injunction came out uh, detailing how the government uh, worked with tech companies to censor its political critics. And among others, uh, Stanford's own Jay Bhattacharya and the signers of the um, Great Barrington Declaration, who turned out to be entirely right about masks, lockdowns, uh, do vaccines help uh, prevent the spread, and, and so forth. Uh, so this seems, uh, this moves us into government. The last stage is, is of course, government uh, suppression of speech, suppression of science. And we're all on uh, social media uh, and AI regulation, which worries me very much about that that too is mostly about regulation of, of speech and now, now that even science is political science. So are, are you as worried as I do? And, and what say you about Missouri v. Biden and, and the Twitter files on the chapter of your next book that's gonna talk about <laughs> Well, actually, so we do have a whole chapter on COVID-19 as a case study uh, before this latest revelation, but it's it's a perfect example of the phenomenon that Greg just described of, of cancel culture devastating trust. Because if someone like Jay Bhattacharya is called a fringe epidemiologist in spite of the fact that he's a Stanford epi epidemiologist, working with uh, Harvard and Oxford epidemiologists by members of um, our, our most prestigious health institutions in the government in private emails and also um, uh, I think Francis Collins called for a swift and devastating takedown of the research. I mean, that's a pretty great way to make an entire society say, why should we believe the experts that are rolling us, the institutions that are, are overseeing our, uh, the vaccines that we're rolling out or the regulations? 
regulations that we have around us. And so I think COVID-19, we've, we've really yet to see the long-term implications of how much um, the lack of epistemic humility that our leaders demonstrated really will have on especially young people, I've noticed, uh, are particularly disillusioned by that. Um, I, I think Missouri v. Biden was, um, I'm, I'm disappointed to see how little attention it's gotten outside of the kind of conservative libertarian spheres, because it's the implications are huge that the, the federal government and several federal agencies were effectively jawboning social media companies by saying like, oh, here's here's a little so-called misinformation that we've delegated. And, you know, it'd be a real shame if all those really favorable policies that you have that are protecting your uh, your <laughs> social media company were to go away somehow. And so I think this this I think it has huge implications. I just I'm concerned that not enough people outside of the um, Twitter sphere have really taken notice yeah, of it. Yeah, I don't mind the swift and devastating takedown if it was based on fact and science, mm -hmm. and if it was not also based on shutting up Jay Bhattacharya. It's silencing, yeah. the, especially in a time when nobody knows science needs that interplay of great ideas based on fact and logic, and, and we're silencing the uh, silencing one whole side. Well, not to mention all the noble lies as well. Of, yeah. uh, I think that was really the most concerning thing, because so, so many of them were so transparent even from the beginning of the pandemic. I mean, I can remember back in the days where we were saying, oh no, don't don't get masks because they don't work or you might touch your face more and so it might actually make things worse, but we also need them for healthcare providers. How does that make any sense? Why not tell the American people, why not treat them like adults and say, well, healthcare providers need the masks more right now because if you get sick, those will be the people on the front lines. And that's, that's how you treat a, a, a group of citizens like adults who are deserving of trust and honesty. And unfortunately, we got just the opposite in the pandemic. Yeah, the, the, the COVID chapter is um, short, but, but short, but devastating. Um, the and, and, and in terms of something that really undermines, you know, faith and expert, I think about the reaction to the uh, first people who started talking about the lab leak hypothesis. And you know, there is a there's a there's a novel respiratory virus lab in Wuhan and, and educated people knew that. So it wasn't a completely crazy thing to do. Um, but I don't know if the lab leak is true. Uh, but I also know you don't know <laughs> if the lab leak is true. And I know for sure that my friends um, that, that were uh, in you know April of 2020 who were 100% sure that this couldn't possibly be true um, and you know uh, trying to get people fired or punished for actually speculating on it. Um, how much damage they did to trust and expertise. Because again, the public isn't stupid. And it's not like, oh, was there some giant investigation of, of, of China? You know, did, was there some huge delegation that figured out what happened? We all knew none of that actually happened. So it was actually the certainty was the problem, like the absolute certainty that it was actually a very unscholarly level of certainty that actually makes you go, I don't, th you guys, I don't think I'm gonna trust you guys in, in the future. So the other thing, of course, that happened since you wrote the book oh, yeah. is the uh, Hamas. You knew this is coming. Oh, yeah. The Hamas terrorist attack. Uh, campuses exploded with pro-Hamas protests. Uh, university leaders, long used to issuing stunning denunciations <laughs> on its blow your nose day, and uh, everybody be careful about that, all of a sudden issued muddles and, and uh, well, both sides and so forth. Uh, Longtime donors are rebelling. Well, if, now, there's much to say about this, but we're here to talk about free speech. Sure. And of course, they, they say, well, wait a minute, don't you believe in freedom of speech? And if we want to go on campus and, and put up kill the Jews signs, that's freedom of speech. Now, the hypocrisy is fairly obvious, considering where freedom of speech was elsewhere. But um, uh, I wonder how you, pro let me just, how do you process these events and what's going on? Um, oh, wow. Yeah, where, where to even begin? With? Well, regarding yeah. freedom of speech, academic freedom, what's going on on campus? I, I would say probably the most interesting thing is the media and how many media calls I, I get that just assumes that there's been a massive crackdown on pro-Palestinian speech on campus. Um, and we are, there are cases, and, and FIRE is completely nonpartisan. By the way, the book actually takes on right and left cancel culture. Like, we, 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 we devote a fair amount of time to it coming from the right. And we, we are defending students and, and professors. But the perception that somehow this is anywhere near as bad as it was after 9-11, it's not, not close so far, and certainly not after 2020, um, n nothing even vaguely close to it, partially because pro-Palestinian point of view is actually fairly popular on campus, and people tend not to clamp down on, on opinions that are popular. The most disturbing thing that we're seeing, though, is a lot more speech that crosses the line into actual threats. 
actual discriminatory harassment, actual common law harassment. I mean, Cornell, there were, there were death threats at Stanford. There was a professor who had his um, students uh, self-identify as Jewish, stand up, take their stuff, go to the corner, and then he would talk about how they were colonizers, and you colonizers have killed more people than died in the, in, in the Holocaust. And, 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 and this got pre, you know, presented to us. Uh, I, I, I got asked about this in Smirkanish, and, and this, like, he was like, well, you know, like, there's the threats to free speech. And I'm like, well, no, there are some. Um, but that's not one of them. Like, you can absolutely punish a professor for, uh, for doing that. They deserve due process, to be clear. Um, but you, you can pr uh, punish a professor for that. So it, it's a, a particularly ugly, concerning time. And a lot of the things you're seeing on video, it's like, no, that's, <laughs> that's assault. <laughs> like, that's actually someone grabbing someone. Like, that's not, that's not protected under any. So it's, it's about as tense and scary of a situation as I've seen in my career. And I'm seeing... Um, uh, I, 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 to say the least, um, it seems like a powder keg. Ricky, you're, you're the most recent person who's been from a student perspective on campus. Uh, yep. How do you think things are evolving here? I mean, I, I'm, I still live right by NYU, and just a couple of days ago, I, I walked past a um, pro-Palestine protest that was so boisterous that I was personally shocked. Um, and we've had a lot of really concerning incidents at NYU, including um, students pulling down posters and uh, numerous threats as well. Um, but I would say, you know, this is, this is a, I think, in part driven by the the lack of viewpoint diversity and actual conversation that happens on campus. And I was looking at NYU statistics recently in Fire Survey actually, and and they ask about a whole host of issues. By the way, only four percent of NYU students say that they never self censor with uh, classroom discussions or in conversations with peers. Only four <laughs> percent, which is crazy. Um, and I certainly was self censoring when I was there, and I was hiding books under my bed in my freshman year because I was so afraid, genuinely. Thomas Soul books, God forbid, because I, <laughs> God forbid someone saw it, then I might get canceled. And honestly, I think that probably would have been the case if they had. Um, but it, they asked students at uh, schools across the country what the most contentious issues are that they feel like they can't talk about. And this is before even uh, the events of this past month. And at NYU, by, f uh, by far the most uh, popular response to the most contentious issue that they felt they couldn't speak out about was the Israeli-Palestine conflict. Mm -hmm. um, and that was over gun rights, over transgender issues, over abortion, you know, all the most contentious issues in society. And so I think that's how you can get some really extreme viewpoints festering in, in places like even elite institutions when there's no actual conversation, when people who have those extreme viewpoints are not challenged because everyone else is self-censoring and doesn't feel like they can actually have an honest and authentic conversation about it. So I saw firsthand on campus how, how um, the kind of conformity gauntlet that we talk about really does drive and, and polarize and, and um, cause more extreme views to never really be challenged robustly. Yeah, so I think we're converging on a view that the issue really isn't free speech, but why it is that universities have chosen to admit, hire, and promote so many people who, given the chance of free speech, choose to use it on, on one very anti-Semitic uh, uh, thing and, and to have well, why is there a political monoculture on campus and just free speech isn't going to cure that. But, but also to be fair, like it, it, so we talk about, you know, legal protections and some of the stuff that is going on, on on campus, you know, does cross the line into threats and intimidation. But we also talk about cancel culture. And while, you know, companies are, are free to f hire or fire whoever they, they, they want. Um, you know, when it's just based on opinion, we get we get concerned. So, so for example, uh, Professor Eisen, you know, who got fired from uh, his uh, his um, uh, scholarly journal because he actually retweeted a kind of vaguely pro-Palestinian onion headline. It's like, no, that's that's cancel culture. Like, like, like that that's that's concerning. And they made made an argument that he actually done bad things in, uh, previously. But listen, if expression is the the straw that broke the the, the camel's back. Uh, we we have a we have an issue with it. So I, I do think there are free speech issues in this, but I think you're also seeing part of the seeds of a lack of free speech on campus. And what, what do I mean by that? Um, I know for a fact a lot of these university presidents, particularly at elite institutions, are are very passionate supporters of Israel, and that they thought the Hamas attacks were horrifying. Um, and watching a lot of these uh, presidents actually get really cautious about saying anything about the, while the attacks were still going on that wasn't uh, being afraid of angering their own students, whereas they commented, you know, very forthrightly on every other topic that had come up under the sun, you know, for the previous several years. 
um, shows like how stifling the environment has actually gotten. Because these are university presidents uh, of elite institutions, you know, the kind of places that have, I don't know, $50 billion to one side on the rainy day fund. They actually were sufficiently scared of their own faculty, of their own students, and their own administrators that they actually decided, I, you know, I can't say something, you know, make the same kind of statement I would because I, I'm afraid of getting canceled. Um, so you did mention, and I think it was praiseworthy of your book, that you try hard to be even-handed mm -hmm. and bipartisan. Uh, you try valiantly to bar balance left and right. And as somebody who works at Stanford, I was actually very surprised to find out quite how much right-wing cancellation there has been. Mm -hmm. I was completely unaware of the phenomenon. Uh, but it's a delicate one, and I think I want to I want to both explore it and diffuse it a little bit. Yeah. Let's let's first acknowledge that most people on both sides still support free speech valiantly, mm. and the problems are a small. No, in polling they do. When when you actually go a little deeper, they're kind of like, well, not not for things I don't like. Uh, <clears throat> well. I'll, I'll let you explore how much, how, I always viewed it as the, the woke millennials versus the Woodstock generation who has still kind of had some free speech. Millennials matters. numbers are depressing. <laughs> well, maybe uh, when, when you get to answer, which isn't yet. Yeah. Uh, I also want to get past whose fault it is and try to understand uh, what's going on. I'm Catholic, so I assume it's mine. <laughs> So I'm going to ask Ricky first, because you're, you're sort of the more libertarian of, of the <laughs> pair. Uh, so let's start with the left. Help us to understand who, where's the core of, of the problem? Who are the enemies of free speech? What do they want? Uh, what dangers do they pose? And then, Greg, I'll ask you to, to do the same question. So, Ricky, go first on, on the left. Yeah, so our um, our history of cancel culture goes through uh, the long genealogy that starts pretty much in academia um, and has festered out into the, the broader um, institutions in society uh, since Her Herbert Marcuse. And um, I think that's kind of the, the original seedling. And it seems to be the ideology of, of wanting to take down um, hate speech or dangerous speech or, or to protect aggrieved minorities, which I can say, having heard that uh, touted time and again by people who are more censor censorious in my classes, that's quite often not the person who's actually in that minority group, but it's on behalf of these faceless masses of people. So I think that there is often a genuine- white kids. Yeah, the, the vanguard of the bourgeoisie will take care of the poor little people. For exactly. You. So I think, I think a lot of it um, is genuinely predicated, at least today, on uh, people who genuinely feel that they're being empathetic and they're trying to protect other people from repugnant speech or hate speech or misinformation or malinformation. I mean, that that term just keeps getting more and more dystopian as it has more <laughs> and more iterations. Um, but I would say on the left that predominantly this is a phenomenon that started on campuses and that a lot of our, our most elite educated people who are now Supreme Court, Supreme Court justices or, or I guess Supreme Court clerks at this point in time, but soon to be Supreme Court justices, which is frightening, um, <laughs> and, and government employees and, and leaders of nonprofits that as time has gone on and those seeds have been sown in in uh, academia and, and kids have gone through the conformity gauntlet of elite higher education and into these positions of power that they've brought with them that, that root that I think people really underestimate just how influential some of those uh, critical thinkers were. Mm -hmm. So Greg, to tell us about uh, who do we worry about on the right? Who's the, uh, not everyone on the right is against free speech, because I know there's a bunch of libertarians who are violently for free well, speech. Well, so. and, and, and I mean. <laughs> where, are your, where are the problems? We, we don't try to do um, some kind of mindless both-siderism, you know, and, and I was on David Pakman's show, you know, um, and uh, he, he's, a, he's a liberal, but like who, who invites on, you know, uh, uh, I, I consider myself a liberal too, uh, but he invites on people that he might disagree with. And the mental energy that he spent just being like, but, but the right's the real problem, it's the right. And I'm like, guys, can we admit that we have a problem? <laughs> that there is a problem with free speech on our side. And by the way, we can't fix the problem on the right. We can fix the problem on our side, but we have to stop pretending we don't have a problem. So when it comes to the right, yeah, we, we, uh, so guess how many uh, um, uh, attacks on uh, higher education curriculum there have been from Republican legislatures? Any guesses? One. 
There's been one, and we defeated it in court. It's called the Stop Woke Act. It was bad, and I went on, went on the air. I've been still in a fight with Chris Rufo about this. It was illiberal, unconstitutional, and we fought it uh, in court, and we won. They rewrote it, and we're going to be challenging it again, and I think we're going to defeat it again. But from what Pacman was saying, for example, you got the impression that this was everywhere, that, um, and people were conflating the attempts to get rid of DEI uh, de bureaucracy. Um, which, which are in some of these laws, but what people don't mention is like, but you do know that in so many fire cases, the people leading the charge on getting pr professors and students punished are DEI administrators. So like they're actually a net negative in a lot of cases for, 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 for free speech. So we point out that basically the main issue are some uh, illiberal and bad laws coming out of um, uh, coming out of some legislatures, honestly, particularly Florida. One, one thing that's happening right now, actually, I can talk about a, a case right now. Students for Justice in Palestine, um, the, Ron DeSantis uh, it, it issued an edict saying that um, uh, that students for justice in Palestine needed to de needed to disaffiliate. It would either be deactivated if it didn't disaffiliate with the national, and um, and the the justification was because students for justice in Palestine national materially supports terrorism. And I'm a constitutional lawyer, and, but, I, 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 but, but at the same time, you don't need to know that that's an incredibly serious charge. And if you have actual evidence that Students for Justice in Palestine is materially supporting terrorism, that's a felony, and they should not just be punished, they should be arrested. Um, but from everything we've seen, it looks like it was more or less just sort of a, uh, th th they were saying that, the, that some of the hortatory language on the website was uh, reached the level of, of saying that, well, you're part of the pro-Palestinian movement. I'm trying to say that's material support. And that's just, that's just not true. That, that, that is just laughable. So we've seen a number of bad things um, in, in some places. I will say, though, for the kind of person who only cares about censorship when it comes from the right, they should be concerned about those professor numbers. Because about one third of the professors that we, we talk about um, getting punished um, of that over a thousand examples that we talk about, um, th those initially come from the right. They, they come from stories in Fox News, sometimes that misrepresent the facts. They come from Turning Point USA, um, you know, for example. Um, but I did also make the point to Pacman that doesn't entirely let, let the left off the hook, though, on that, because in a lot of cases, the ones doing the actual firing at the end, giving in to, you know, like a, a, a con, a, an angry conservative mob, are actually um, administrators on the left as well. And the simple fact is, if higher education, uh, since it's super, like a super majority left leaning, if it was as good on free speech um, as I believed we were when I was younger, None of this would be happening at all. They would be standing up for professors left and right, but they are unfortunately too often leading the charge against them. So uh, although you've tried to be even handed, uh, although I start from sort of more Ricky's chair on this one, yeah. uh, I do, you know, the left uh, won the long march of the institutions. They own the DEI office. They own the media and yep. all the rest. On the right, you describe uh, ham-handed anti-woke politicians, some book-burning social conservatives, some Trump supporters, and, and what you call a fringe theory from the Opus Dei wing of the conservative <laughs> We don't call that. that. That's a quote from Bob Corner Veer. Uh, yeah, the, uh, the, but it was lovely. The, yeah. the left has Harvard, Yale, Princeton, and Stanford. The right has Collin College, University of Rhode Island, Montana State, University of Kentucky. <laughs> so I, I still am a little bit more worried uh, about the, uh, the left uh, rather than... Uh, but that, but that right. shows up in the book. I mean, like, we're yes. going to take tremendous flack for the fact that only three chapters on the right and so much more on the left. It's like, that's pretty proportional, as best we can tell. Like, like the, um, and we do want to draw attention to the, the, the professors who lost their job. But the problem, the, the, the most serious problem of those professor cancellations that people need to get is that they are overwhelmingly concentrated in the most elite colleges in the country, the top 10 schools in the country, and those, and those overwhelmingly, those cancellations come from the left. And when it comes to professors, those are largely from the left. When it comes to students, they're overwhelmingly from the, uh, from the left. And the reason why this should be so concerning is because for whatever reason, we get our ruling class from Harvard and Yale and Stanford, um, and, uh, and these are the schools with the biggest cancel, uh, cancel culture uh, pr problem. I mean. I, I, are people familiar with the, the uh, FIRE campus free speech ranking? Yes. Okay, cool. Um, you know, it's the largest study we've a, a ever conducted of student opinion. 55,000 students, uh, panels for, for 248 schools. Well, the four largest databases of professor cancellations, student cancellations, uh, speech codes, and, um, uh, and deplatforming. And 
Harvard did so badly on it, they actually got a negative score. And we had to round them up to zero. <laughs> and, th and they decided to challenge our methodology, which was an opportunity to be like, OK, you want me to talk to Wall Street Journal about our methodology? And, and, and they've kind of uh, you know, stopped that line of attack <laughs> and now seem to think they have a problem. But th and it's interesting to show kind of like where things ended up. I, will, I think I've already mentioned this, but UVA and University of Chicago actually do quite well. They're the two elite colleges. A lot of our top 10 colleges were actually technical colleges, which isn't surprising. You know, like I, I think they have a little bit more immunity to some of this, not, not perfect. But the bottom four colleges were um, Harvard by a lot. University of Pennsylvania, Georgetown, boy did they earn that, um, and University of, uh, uh, of, of South Carolina. So like, it, it, is, it is an interesting uh, mix of, of where you end up, but I'd, r I'd really love to end up, you know, to do f the top 500 schools in the country, because I think right now there are a lot of people who are trying to figure out where do I send my kids where they won't get canceled and they'll actually learn things. Well, one of, one of your cures is maybe we should, uh uh, start hiring out of the elite, and maybe the elite colleges are so quickly shooting themselves in the foot that that'll happen quickly. Yeah. Let's talk about the cures. I have to admit, so the book says what to do about it and the cures. Yeah. I have to admit, uh, yeah, I've got a little depressed about the cures. Yes, you, you outline a radical restructuring of universities, but not quite who's going to take over the yeah. universities and make it happen. You emphasize rules for better rhetoric, which I love, but the opponents of free speech deplore traditional enlightenment rhetoric. On the left, you know, if you say logic and evidence, they say that's colonialist, white supremacist, racist thinking. Uh, and if you, you know, faced with their latest ideological word salad, it's hard to see what actually there is to discuss on a factual basis anyway. The far right uh, says, look, we're faced with a Maoist Bolshevik cultural revolution aimed at seizing power. There's no free speech in a war. And uh, voluntarily abiding by better rhetoric doesn't seem like a solution that's going to happen. Ricky, take this one first. Well, a few things. First, on the on the front of, um, of of colleges and who's actually going to reform them, there's two trends that I find heartening. Um, first is a very recent one, which is that we're actually seeing donors saying that they're going to withhold their donations to these elite universities. Yeah. I mean, it remains to be seen whether or not they actually do so, but I do think that that actually will inspire meaningful change. A second one is a trend that I'm a part of. I, I dropped out of NYU because I wasn't going to pay full tuition for Zoom school, let alone Zoom. <laughs> school that I felt like I had to self-censor in. Um, and I'm part of a growing number of young people who are, who are doing that. There are millions fewer college students now than there were a decade ago. And I think that there will be a meaningful market correction, especially as there's been more attention paid to the student loan crisis and how a lot of these degrees are not actually serving kids in the way that, that they expected to. So I think that there are more young people who are saying, you know, there are more than one pathway to success. And so that can exert some market pressure on these schools as well. Um, but then also also, to respond to your question about whether or not there's a motivation to uh, reclaim those free speech values, I actually think that there's a huge hunger for that in the youngest generation, in Gen Z, my generation, which a lot of people are surprised to find that even though millennials have the most popular view or most positive view of cancel culture, which gets more and more negative as generations get older, Gen Z completely switches that and actually has the most negative view of any generation of cancel culture. And I think that's the result of having grown up in it. But there's then the other issue that I didn't, I hadn't read John Stuart Mill's On Liberty until I dropped out of NYU, which is a really depressing fact. <laughs> and only 22% of eighth graders are proficient in civics education. Young people know that they don't want to live in a world where they're surrounded by tripwire and they can't say what they think or, or engage in thought experimentation, but they've not been given the positive restorative pathway out of that. And I think that if we can actually teach them what it means to live in a free speech culture and what it means to live in a society that appreciates dissent and doesn't tear people down, then we actually could find a huge swath of people who are actually hungry for that sort of reclamation. There's hope that it's not deep and that knowing I've been lied to for 20 years oh. the hunger for... for well, no, it, it's, it's deep. <laughs> I mean, we, we spend a third of the book talking about potential uh, solutions, or not so much solutions as things that can make it you know, somewhat better, um, partially because we know that this is not an easy thing to fix. We wouldn't have actually, you know, and we try to address it on a parental level. Um, I, we always try to get parenting in there because we think it's, it's key. Um, you know, big ideas on principles that should guide K through 12 reform. We want positive principles uh, that are incompatible 
incompatible with some of the um, uh, some of the divisiveness. Uh, we talk about what corporations can do to keep themselves out of the culture war, which I think there is a genuine hunger for, and I'm definitely hearing that from people in Silicon Valley that they, they uh, at least the people that I know, they're saying it's like, yeah, you know, maybe, maybe we should um, uh, w try to avoid hiring counselors in the first place. But when it comes to higher education, you know, like with that, we spent a lot of time on that. I had a piece in the National Review for some kind of modest suggestions uh, earlier this week. My Substack adds a little bit more radical ones, and I'm going to be I'm, I'm going to be adding to it. But I do think a big part of it is a a lot fewer jobs need to require a, a BA I, I, or a college degree because I think the amount that they're charging for you, a lot of these just aren't worth it. And I think we need alternate ways of sort of showing that you're super smart and, and hardworking because this is like the market signal that you get from the elite colleges is getting worse and worse every year. So let's take Harvard to pick on them again. Just to, that's where I know a lot of the data from. Something like 43, 45% of white students at Harvard are either kids of legacies, um, uh, kids of professors, or athletes. And the average GPA at Harvard is 3.8. Average. Uh, th that was summa cum laude at my school. Like, that, that's insane. So you might be getting a really hardworking, brilliant kid from Harvard. Or you might be getting someone who, you know, waltzed in because they're a th three-time legacy and a, a kid of a major donor who got a 3.6 and learned nothing and had a great freaking time. Um, there has got to be a better way uh, to actually have people, you know, demonstrate that they're extremely smart and extremely hardworking. I've even suggested the idea of there being an, some, ins you know, some billionaire should put together some insanely difficult test that only like one in a thousand people. That basically might be the entire liberal arts um, uh, curriculum for, for from like the from like 50 years ago when you actually had to read everything. What? Actually, one good idea that's coming up from the left yeah. is skill-based hiring, decredentialing, uh, you know, hiring people not just what's on their CV, but what they know. Yeah, I At, it is 15, so that is the time that we move on to questions from the uh, audience. I did, I did want to say one thing. When I, when I told people that I was writing a book with a 20-year-old I hadn't met, uh, and we actually, we, we signed the book having not actually met in person, um, which was funny, because when I first saw her, I'm like, oh my God, you're a kid. <laughs> um, the, I, I got to Jonathan Rausch, who's a friend, he thought I was crazy, but it's always nice to do a talk with Ricky, because it's kind of like, you know, this is a brilliant 23-year-old that I, I feel very lucky to have gotten to write with. Thank you. Okay, I, I love these cards, because finally I get to do this. I've been waiting a long time. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Tonight, too, for those. The of first you one is, how sound. dare you? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. So, uh, Ricky, what one thing subject comes to mind, which would have been this book and didn't make it in? Also, favorite cocktail. Ooh. Mm. <laughs> um, my Slavic genes come out, so I'm a kettle and martini girl. <laughs> but um, I would say the thing that I, I wish I had. I mean, I, I mentioned it before. I'm like the receptacle for everyone's kids' cancel culture horror stories now. And I, I wish that we, um, by the time we had written this book, had more of those stories to kind of put the flesh in the bones of how young this is happening to kids. I mean, literally, I hear from the parents of, of middle schoolers, 10 and 11 year olds who are just getting phones and who, um, who have really traumatic experiences early on. And I wish that. Um, you know, I think that's something that is only just a burgeoning trend, and I wish that we were able to put more of a, a fine point on that in the book, for sure. But it's something that I definitely feel motivated to write about in the future. Uh, I wish we could have had a chapter on uh, how bad it's gotten with, with debate te uh, teams out oh, there. Oh, debate teams, yeah, yes. I, 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 that depresses me. To One more insul institution taken well, over. One more, because we tried to give a special focus. We knew we couldn't cover the entire world of cancel culture, because that would have been a 5,000-page book. Um, we tried to focus on knowledge-producing institutions, because we think cancel culture there is especially pernicious and, and damaging. But these some of the stories... Um, and research we've been able to do on what's going on with some of the debate leagues are just depressing as all get out. Well, I give you a title, you're ready to start your next book. <laughs> okay, here we go. Uh, <laughs> any faculty member who stands up in a virtue signaling environment and dissents loses access to the recognition that he, she, or she has worked uh, all their lives to achieve, which I would add, e even if you don't get fired, you're uh, off in the corner yeah. office for the rest of your life. Good luck publishing. Good luck being invited. Dr. Pariah. Yeah. yeah, Dr. Pariah. What can we say to them to persuade them to pay this cost and, and have the courage to stand up? 
I mean, I would say work for fire. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, one thing that I, I noticed from speaking at while I was still at NYU and writing op-eds was how many people were silently sitting around me with very similar viewpoints or at least a similar concern about free speech. And I, it, it really motivated me when I heard from, from classmates and professors and deans even at NYU who all said to me, I completely agree with you, but just don't tell anyone that we had this conversation. <laughs> like, this, is, this is a huge problem. There are more people around you than you realize that I actually feel the same way. Um, and I do believe that courage is contagious. And I think especially young people are, are really hungry for examples uh, from, from faculty members who are unafraid to, to speak their minds and be honest and authentic in their opinions. And so I think that's potentially the best possible motivation is to, to lead by example. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I will add, in setting, putting up a uh, free speech conference, academic freedom conference a while ago, I was told by several faculty, I can't be seen on the program with X. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I mean, the thing that from doing this, uh, defending professors for 22 years, one thing that I, I can say that, that is um, not necessarily going to give them courage, but motivation to take their case public is you are much, much safer if the public knows about you being targeted than if not. I can't tell you how many professors I've dealt with who are like, it'll just go away. No, you'll just go away. That, like if, if nobody's actually watching, they're going to figure out a way to get rid of you. And I actually, one year into my career, I had a professor write, write an article basically saying, yeah, I should have listened to Fire, um, because he, they were right. They, that, that essentially, like, if it's not in the, in the public glare, you are much more vulnerable. Are there moral viewpoints that should result in cancellation? A recent example is the revocation of job offers for supporters of the Hamas uh, massacre. Mm-hmm. We, we had a, in the appendix just an argument that you can argue that people are canceled appropriately. Like, we, we don't leave that uh, out, as a, out, out as a possibility. And um, we just want, the, really what we're arguing for from a free speech culture perspective is since culture can only ever be competing norms, we want a thumb on the scale for people at least pausing and saying, as an employer, I think everyone's entitled to their opinion. If they, if that, if there was any thumb on the scale for that now, I, I would appreciate that. Because if you looked at like 20, uh, 2020 and 2021, it looked like we were heading into a country where essentially every company was both a, um, a, a hedge fund and a political army that had particular points of view. And if you disagreed with it, you could be fired, which leads to a situation in which uh, you, you, we have a First Amendment, but, but you can't actually have an opinion and expect to make a living. So, but people misunderstand what we're saying by this. We're saying that if there was some consideration of the idea of um, of everyone's entitled to their opinion, might that prevent some of the many ridiculous cases we see in this book? I think so. Is that going to get Goldman uh, want want to hire you know someone you know uh, who said Hamas was right? Probably not. Um, but a little bit of rebalancing uh, to 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 respect uh, the fact that your employees have points of view. Yeah, any step in the right direction w- w- would be overall welcome. I think part part of our rules uh, for engagement is. Um, when we're discussing one thing, I really don't pay that much attention to what you think about something else. Yeah. Uh, and so narrower purpose institutions are important uh, and, and a little bit of, uh, of forgiveness for people having crazy ideas so long as they uh, operate in one place. Oh, but I, but I always have a caveat to that too. Um, make sure you're not actually hiring a counselor in the first place because yeah. a lot of these elite school graduates and this this was said to me by you know, um, uh, corporation heads all over the country they show up and they want you to fire people for not agreeing with their politics so yes hire people who agree to obey by the rules of rhetoric which are nicely set out in there we didn't have time to get there mm-hmm. but who don't pile on don't use ad hominem attacks don't insult your motiv- motivations that's the key thing that you want even if they have somewhat nutty ideas <laughs> yeah things yeah and one example that just puts a, a point on that it comes from coinbase where um, their CEO set out a policy um, I think in the wake of BLM and and pressures to uh, to to make an institutional statement about that where they said we're not a political organization you can have your own politics in your own private life and if that's a problem for you then here's a great severance package and so long and actually five percent of their employees took that and those are not the five percent of people that you want to work with but if you can <laughs> draw the line in the sand and say from this point forward this is how we operate in, in this institution I think that that's a really positive uh, pathway and potentially a really effective filtering mechanism. 
When universities make position statements on international or political affairs, is this not usurping the free speech of their participants? Ricky, you go first. I mean, I, I definitely think that institutions do not have viewpoints. Institutions are made up of people who have viewpoints. This has been pretty evident for years. I was always confused at NYU when I would get emails about like Kyle Rittenhouse from our university president. I'm like, why? <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think it's it's really um, illuminating that this is the moment in time when all of a <laughs> yes. sudden colleges and universities are, are realizing as much. I think it's a really disturbing um, and not coincidental situation at the moment um but i do think that a, a restoration of of that the um is it the calvin calvin principle? report, calvin calvin report? And, yeah and like, i Hill mean report that is a that is a positive way forward i just i, th I am disturbed by the fact that yeah. all of a sudden it took this past month for schools to finally come but, to that revelation and we'll see if they if they keep that, that's yeah the not, exactly. I, I, the, it's, it's gonna take years for me if they really have turned over a new leaf i'll believe it when i see it but they always say this stuff when they think they're being threatened from outside and they always abandon it as soon as it becomes politically you know uh, more convenient for them to drop it so even though i want the calvin report and i want schools talking about free speech i am just as cynical and skeptical that they really mean it as everyone else well also um it's quite common that universities have beautiful statements of freedom yes. on the masthead yeah but that the bureaucracy veritas ish doesn't act that way <laughs> well the, a lot of them are free speech many of them are free speech but so long as nobody feels too insulted yeah and then even more of those have beautiful statements but then the bureaucracy is enforcing all sorts of things and it you can't appeal to that statement of free speech to stop yourself from being canceled which brings me to the next question from our audience is it the pro is the problem on elite campus is not the students but the administrators and the question goes on but i'll leave you to, to go on that quest on that first part oh i mean the the, the big thing um sometimes when people read coddling the american mind they think what height and i are saying is that um uh, that it used to be the administrators who got everybody in trouble because um, i always say this in unlearning liberty my first book that the uh, Students were great on free speech back then, uh, prior to 2012, like genuinely better than professors, certainly better than administrators. And our major opponent were administrators, usually mid-level ones who would go after people, uh, professors and, and, and students. But people think that what we're saying is that when Gen Z started hitting higher ed around 2014, and there was this really dramatic shift that was not the least bit subtle um, that, that we both saw at the same time. Um, that it suddenly became the students and administrators didn't matter. That is not at all what's happening. Um, administrators are oftentimes encouraging those students to form the, to, to in some cases do the shout downs. I mean, we saw this in action at Stanford, for example, you know, where, where the Tyrion Steinbach who had met with the, with the angry students for hours uh, in advance and then showed up just conveniently, you know, stopped it right at, stopped the shout down right at 10 minute mark, get up and give a seven minute speech on is the juice of free speech worse than the squeeze? And the only thing that was kind of like uh, uh, so uh, illustrative of that case is one of the rare ones where, he, where actually the, the administrator in question was so determined to put themselves in the spotlight that you could see how much this is encouraged along by administrators. So one of the reforms that I, I really want to stress is every time on campus that there's a deplatforming, there is a cancellation of a professor or a student, um, that, or, or even just you know like what happened to Carol Hooven, they need to do two things. They need to launch an investigation, and they need to see um, did the administrator did administrators do anything to stop this? And if they didn't do anything to stop it, they should be reprimanded. Uh, on the other hand, did the administration did administrators did any administrators help this along? Were they organizing it, which we have evidence of this happening in a, in a lot of cases. Were they encouraging it? Like, was this ultimately administrators who made this possible? Were they refusing to punish people, uh, some people uh, uh, rather than others? And if that's the case, if you have someone who's actually a threat to academic freedom and free speech among your administration, they should lose their jobs. Um, the question is, is the stated goal of activist education compatible with individual student rights? And I, I want to expand a little bit. Universities. Uh, I think have a tension between their two goals and uh, well, we'll see which one they choose. On the one side, a traditional commitment to excellence, meritocracy, the pursuit of knowledge. Mm -hmm. On the other side, um, social activism. We are here, we know what the sort of right social thing is and we are here to, to push society towards it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think this is a, a huge and inherent tension that concerns me. I mean, 
From my own uh, background, I, I went to a boarding school, and it honestly concerns me more in the younger grades than it does in, in higher education even, because at least 18-year-olds should be relatively adultish enough to figure out if they want to be activated by their education. Um, but I, I mean, I think back on so many things that happened in my own education, including when I was 14 being separated on, on Martin Luther King Jr. Day into separate buildings based on our race to talk about our racial experiences, or when my school set up buses to ship kids down to D.C. to participate in protests that the school paid for the buses to send them down there. And not all protests, though. No, yeah, oh, no, certainly not all protests. <laughs> um, but I think even like the younger the grade, the more I'm concerned by this because it, it feels like um, like something really precious in figuring out your own political orientation and, and what what matters to you and what you want to be an activist about at an age like 14, especially at a boarding school where your parents aren't there and you're, you're, the faculty around you are effectively your parents, like that, I think it starts so much earlier even than college. And it concerns me on college, but even more so in, in that setting. Yeah, colleges often say in their admissions, we're looking for students who are yeah. activists. And I go, you're 18, you don't know enough to be an activist about anything. But learn something about <laughs> that. But that's also a political limits test. I mean, they're, they're choosing yes. students whether or not they're already activists. And of course, okay. the problem with activism is that it's an act of certainty. You know, essentially, like if you're willing to go f go out and fight something, that means your mind is totally made up and you're so sure that the other side could not be right that you're willing to fight it with all your all, all your might. And what you should be cultivating in young people is epistemic humility, uh, the, uh, an appreciation yeah. for how little any of us know in the grand scheme of things. Um, it just, I think it goes very much against the spirit of a quality education. So we're down to one, and I have one last very short question for a very short answer. It's yeah. a softball. You note in the book, free speech is a rare and recent idea. Throughout most of history, uh, you didn't have free speech or thinking, either for religious or political reasons. So just give us, in a couple of words, why is free speech, the free speech culture, freedom of thought, so important for our society? Because false beliefs and misinformation often turn out to be true, and history is a lesson in that. And if we want to get closer to truth, we need to open ourselves up to hearing dissenting viewpoints. I think the most underappreciated value of freedom of speech um, is that it, uh, is that the pro project of human knowledge is to know the world as it is, and you cannot know the world as it is unless you know what people really think and why. And that's especially true not 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 uh, if people believe monstrous or awful things. You are not safer for knowing less about what people really think. Thank you both. That was beautiful. Great book. Thank you for your questions.